everybody this is harbinger report and i am john bell the fifth horseman of the apocalypse bringing you the news on the apocalypse basically anyway tonight's show is going to be about um what is dog man now this is a subject and a topic that a lot of people uh, in this audience are already familiar with um but uh, for any new people out there, I want to recap some things and uh, and try to present it in a little bit of a different different way with uh, some other supported materials. And just kind of recapping the whole theme of the show, um, going back from the ancient times to present, uh, basically my theories on this. There's many, many out there and not knocking anyone else's. Um, I've, I've got my own based on my own research, background, experiences, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, form kind of uh, my conclusion and kind of a, I try to stick with a bigger picture point of view, so to speak, as much as possible. And uh, apparently it works because a lot of people um, say that that they really enjoy that. So um, that's great because that's what I'm trying to accomplish here is bringing the big picture. I'm not trying to get focused on one single detail. You know, a lot of people just focus on just one topic in this field, one cryptid in this field. Um, and now you're finding a lot of show hosts are starting to expand. You know, like I was in with uh, Dogman Cams before, but it was really difficult because you kind of, I kind of pigeonholed myself with that because it's very hard to find credible guests that have had real encounters uh, with these, uh, these creatures. I mean, they're real, but they're, they're still rare. Thank God for now. <laughs> Anyway, so that being the case, let's uh, jump into the topic. Uh, and I got to apologize a little bit. I've been working out in the yard for the last two days, pulling long hours, and I can barely move right now or keep my eyes open. So uh, I, I hope I can uh, do a good job for you guys. But anyway, anyway, what is Dog Man? So first off, Dog Man is the study of basically cryptozoology, which is a newer type of of subject and science in the field, if you will. I mean, for lack of a better word, I don't know what else to really call it. Um, but in the study of cryptozoology, uh, people focus on studying the uh, concept of cryptids. And cryptid basically, and this is just, you know, non-scientific terms for this kind of stuff, just kind of layman's explanations. But a cryptid is basically something that's not supposed to exist, but apparently there's a lot of people that claim that they have sightings of these creatures. Uh, the most, you know, prolific that everyone knows of the top of their heads, like Bigfoot, you know, Bigfoot is a completely a household name, uh, but it wasn't for a long time. And more and more, it's becoming more and more mainstream. Well, Bigfoot, which is still very real and very out there is kind of the older topic. The newer topic now is dog man. And there's still many, uh, people in the public that don't have a real concept are new to what dog man actually is. Uh, and for lack of a better word, dog man is a werewolf. All right. Um, in Cajun, Louisiana, they call it loop guru or, or rugularu. They call it by different names. Rugularu, loop guru. There's several others. The most common, I think, is rugularu and then loop guru. Uh, but there's several different names that they give it. But 
the reason that the Cajuns have this term that goes all the way back to like the 1800s, you know, the, remember the Louisiana purchase, right? One of the oldest parts of the United States and the old Cajuns, they had their own stories of basically werewolves that they were encountering in the swamps in the wilderness. And that goes way, way back, you know, so much so that they named it the Rugleroo, all right, or Loop Guru, depending on, you know, where you're from or, you know, what, 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 what you, what they call it in those different regional areas, I guess. But anyway, that said, it's amazing because there are literally stories of werewolves and vampires for that matter, which I also believe are very true. I mean, doesn't mean it's like the movies. Um, like for example, even werewolves and dog man, for lack of a better word, I'm lumping them together right now, but they werewolves and dog men, they, uh, they, it's not like the movies where somebody, you know, human transforms into a monster. All right. Now there are some stories that, that, that is a real thing in basically satanic occult worships, you know, um, I haven't found enough credible evidence on that to like really report on it, but I have read several accounts and heard people's testimony where they claim that a high level satanic type occult organizations, they're able to, you know, be gifted, if you will, with that kind of craziness, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And I think an equivalent to that would be kind of like the notion of the skinwalker or the Wendigo, which are very different things and not trying to step on native culture because they take that very serious. But the, the skinwalker, very similar to what, um, what, what, what the occultists would describe, uh, whereas they have to do something heinously evil in order to be gifted with this ability uh, from, from basically a cult uh, evil. And I would, I would say, you know, satanic means. And um, there's different stories of that, but, one of the most common in that is that you have to kill a loved one in order to prove your worthiness for that. And it's, it's like, uh, you have to kill like, you know, your mom, your wife, your child, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's heinous. Uh, what's interesting is when I interviewed Sancho about the, the Mexican cartel, Sancho said he wanted, he told his buddy that got him in. He said, I want to move up in the organization. I want to move up in the cartel. And the guy says, no, you don't want to do that. And he's like, why, man, why? I'm tough. I'm strong. I can do it, you know? And the guy's like, no, you don't understand. He's like, in order to move up in this organization, you have to you have to do, like, heinous acts that, like, basically just destroy your soul. I mean, that's actually what it's designed to do. In order to get there, you've got to, you know, literally destroy your soul. Um, and uh, so so he said, like, what do you mean, heinous act? And, the, and his higher up told him. He says, you have to be willing to kill someone you love, that you genuinely love to prove your like worthiness or kind of thing. But anyway, that's that's one side of that. That's uh, many tales of skinwalkers I've heard similar to that. And then of cold, uh, cold organizations. But that's not where, what I'm really talking about tonight. Um, I thought it was worth bringing up just because it is one of the concepts out there of what a dog man or werewolf could be. Uh, and there are spiritual components. A lot of times people will talk about, and uh, I'll swing back to that a little bit later. Um, but coming back to dog man per se itself, right? So it's not something like the movies that transforms from a human into a creature for the most, the basic understanding of a dog man. Okay. Or werewolf for that matter. I'm lumping those together right now. So there's a creature out there that is is a living creature that lives in the wilderness and for lack of a better word if you saw it it's not a human that transforms but it's some type of animal or other creature that for all intents and purposes it looks like a werewolf straight out the movies you know what i'm saying so um so that's what people call it now it is believed that it's part like bigfoot it's believed that Bigfoot and many actual DNA studies that have been done, including here in Louisiana recently, um, it's been it's been proven that Bigfoot's like half human, half other unidentified animal. All right. Same with the dog man in many, uh, many reports. 
is that it it seems to be half human, half other kind of creature. All right. So so that's one thing to uh, to understand. Now, I believe personally, my own personal take, as many of you know, um, with my background in theology and studying ancient biblical texts, I believe back to the whole story of uh, that we've talked about several times on here. And I'll continue to bring it up because it all links everything together. But going back to the book of Enoch, right, where it talks about and just doing a recap of that from even other shows, talks about how Enoch explains how fallen angels came down here, took human wives, and they created uh, giants known as the Nephilim, all right? And those giants walked the earth, all right? Uh, here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln when he was given a famous speech at Niagara Falls and talked about how giants once walked across the United, the United States. So, um, but anyway, so the giants, they chose human wives. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and they took uh, to wives such, such as they chose. And the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards denoted by the flood, most scholars say. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, uh, they were the mighty men of old, the men of renown, like Hercules, like Perseus, the demigods, basically, is what they were, demigods from Greek mythology, which isn't mythology, it's reality, all right? Uh, it's, it's the sons of God mixing with, with human, uh, human DNA. Now, what I often bring up that a lot of people miscount, even that study and, and research this stuff is, so the fallen angels created the Nephilim. Well, the Nephilim, with the help of the fallen angels, created a third race. And that third race is known as the Chimera. The Chimera was the mixing of human and animal DNA to create nightmare creatures. All right. So basically, again, Egyptian and uh, Greek mythology, all real. Mermaids, centaurs, uh, cyclops, uh, all that stuff. Real, I claim. All right. I don't think they were just making that up. Now. I do claim that on a macro level, not a micro level, meaning that doesn't mean every story and name is true. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of embellishment or things changed in history or whatever. But I'm saying overall, big picture, those things took place. Those things were real. Those things happened. OK, now, the reason this is very important uh, is because that's not the thing I was trying to pull up. <laughs> Anyway, the reason this is important is because Jesus says in the New Testament, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be again uh, at the end. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So at the end, okay? And many claim that we are approaching that time now, okay? And that's what I claim. But I also claim that these things were created in our ancient past. They were created by the Nephilim with the help of the fallen angels, creating the species of the Chimera, which was all kinds of animals and creatures. And there's different theories on that. Rob Skiba, whose son I did a show with, but I got it got removed from, uh, from here because I talked about some science that uh, they say is... Um, you know, uh, disinformation, even though my stepfather was a Nobel Prize nominated virologist. So I think I know what I'm talking about a little bit on the topic. <laughs> anyway, um, so but I was trying to get Rob Skiba on my show before he passed away. I've mentioned that several times. I'm a big fan of him and his work, his research mimicked mine. He did a much better job of it than I do. And uh, and he's a, it's a great loss that we don't have him with us anymore. And he was a good man. That said, um, you can find his material online, especially the identity of the Antichrist, which matches my own uh, research and, and discovery in this, this journey called life. But uh, anyway, Rob Skiba had a theory that when God pronounced judgment on the, the, the Nephilim, that he was going to kill them all off the planet, he started a war amongst the Nephilim. Now, what's crazy is, the Nephilim, like most of them killed each other off. All right. In a giant war. And this war was so big, it, it became known as the clash of the Titans. You know where we get like the name of the modern movies and the old movie that I saw in the eighties of clash, of the Titans. That was a real thing. That was real. And that came from the war 
that God, God initiated. He said, I'm going to start a war between them so that they kill each other off. He even told the fallen, and he put the fallen angels in prison in Tartarus, right? That's even um, St. Peter in the New Testament speaks of, okay? But um, God imprisons them, but part of the punishment of the fallen angels is they would have to watch all their sons die, you know, that they're so proud of. It was part of their punishment. And then God said that because they were part uh, uh, angelic, if you will, that they had immortal souls, that the giants, when they died, they would become known as evil spirits and they would make war against the Benini, the human race, until the end of, of time, until the end of, of, the, of the, the earth. OK, so basically what Enoch is saying there is what we refer to as demons aren't really fallen angels. It's the disembodied souls of the giants that become the uh, what we know as demons. And that's also why in like the Bible, you always see this concept of demonic possession because a disembodied soul never feels right until it's reunited with a body. OK, so that's part of the reason that you often find possession. Uh, and by the way, you can be possessed and not be like, nah, you know what I mean? It's the, uh, a lot of times the people that are, are demonically possessed, the demon doesn't want to show itself. It wants to stay hidden because if it stays hidden, it can do what it wants. If it shows itself, well, then, then it's a threat to it being forced out or gotten rid of. Okay. So, um, so just because people aren't, you know, foaming at the mouth and acting crazy doesn't mean they're not possessed. There are many people that walk around us today that are completely possessed for one degree or another. When I say completely, I mean, they're, that doesn't mean they're the, the demon acts full time as, as the demon, you know, but there's cooperations. I've met people before that uh, were in exorcisms and um, it couldn't be gotten rid of because the person wouldn't let it go because it convinced them the person, the, the one person I'm referring to, they uh, were very insecure and the demon made them feel secure. So he didn't want to let the demon go because it was a safety blanket. You know, it, it made him feel strong and powerful kind of thing. You see what I'm saying? So, um, so that was kind of the, the concept of that. But anyway, so you had the disembodied souls of the giants, right? Well, and again, the giants created the race of the chimeras. And the chimeras were all kinds of mixing of human and animal DNA. In fact, the book of Enoch says that the giants sinned against birds, man, the, uh, animals, plants, the grass. I mean, all these things. And, um, and, and I, I really wondered what the heck does that mean? That it, how did they sin against grass? How did they sin against plants and, and people and birds? You know, and and what I ended up understanding was it was because of the mixing of the DNA. They were mixing all kinds of DNA. But what's interesting is we've come full circle. All right. Jesus says that the end, again, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be again at the coming of the Son of Man. It will be again at the end. That's what's so important. We've reached now today where with a full circle where we return to the evil of the days of Noah. And that's important because you got to understand what was it like in the days of Noah. You got to understand that you without that, you don't understand what's what's going to happen now or what's happening next. Right. Because all that's coming back. But not only that, God warns this. He destroyed the earth with a flood to end up eventually remove that when he had enough. Well, if we return to that same evil, uh, if you do a careful reading of the Bible, God's going to destroy the earth the second time. The first time he destroyed it with water. The second time he's going to destroy it with fire. All right. Uh, that's in Isaiah 13. That's in Malachi chapter four, which is just reiterating Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13 also talks about the return of the Nephilim. Let me see if I've got that little quotey. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones, have summoned my mighty men. Anytime you see in the Bible where it says mighty men, it, almost always it means Nephilim. To execute my anger, my proudly exalted ones. All right. They come 
from a distant land, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole earth. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As the destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Uh, um, therefore, all hands will be feeble and every man's heart will melt. All right. Uh, and he goes on to say, uh, I will make mankind more rare than the finest gold upon the planet. And if you know anything about gold, there's not a lot of it. There really isn't a lot of it. So what God's saying is he's basically going to do what he did with Noah. All right. Um, he's going to do what he did with Noah. There's going to be a second deluge. Right. And I always talk about my uh, my um, piece from wherever uh, from the, the from the story of Gilgamesh that had, depicts the flood on it. I don't know where that little joker is. I don't know. I pull it up all the time. It's here somewhere. Um, anyway, so that's where I believe the origins of Dogman actually came from or started. Okay. Uh, and it's important. Now, here's something else. Since we're on the topic, this is a goat man. Okay. And a goat man for, is, is called a satyr. The Bible refers to a goat man as a satyr. All right. And a satyr is half human, half goat. And there are many, many stories across the U.S. and around the world of goat men. OK, just like I was saying before of dog men, there are stories of, of vampires and werewolves on every major culture going back for, you know, just just thousands and thousands of years. That's not an accident. That's not just because people like those stories. That's because there's some truth and reality to that. If there's good in the world, there's also evil. So that's important. This is a satyr, a goat man. This actual picture, I believe, came off of a news report. Uh, this came off a trail camera and actually made local news, I think, like in Kentucky or something like that. Um, but anyway, uh, so there are all kinds of cryptids and people are saying they're seeing other kinds of cryptids now, you know, but sticking on the subject and focusing on dog man. So here's some artist renditions of what a dog man looks like. All right. The, the height is usually six to nine feet, although there are stories of larger ones. I've heard stories of some that were even like 10 to 14 feet tall, but that's very rare. Most stories you hear are about six to nine feet tall. A six foot tall one more than likely is going to be a juvenile. And uh, as as it gets older, it'll get it'll get taller Then they max out usually around eight to nine feet. OK, another artist rendition. These are very common photos that you can find in a search online. Here's a size comparison of how they can be basically six to, you know, you know, even 10 feet tall. Most common I hear is nine, nine feet. All right. Here's a very popular picture you see many times, even on many shows online of what a dog man looks like. Now, I'll swing back to this later, but uh, I did my last show because I wanted to I wanted to retell Victor's story. All right. Because Victor talks about a difference between uh, basically a werewolf and a dog man. OK. And he says he claims that there's two there's two different kinds, uh, basically. The dog man looks more like a wolf that is can stand on two legs. However, it has hands like a human being. It has shoulders like a human being. Uh, usually the arms are a little bit elongated a lot of times in people's depictions. Where, and, and notice it also has legs like a dog. Uh, the backward honks, okay, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, that would be depictions of a dog man. Whereas a, um, a werewolf, he described, uh, Victor described, would have more, it would look more like a, a Bigfoot that has a obviously canine head on it, right? Maybe longer claws. Um, I'm not exactly sure which one, the dog man or the other has longer claws. But, but notice in this one, it has normal legs like a human being, still mostly covered in hair. And it has no tail and the, 
the the muzzle on the face, though it can be truded out, isn't usually as long as an actual dog man. All right. So that would be kind of the difference between a dog man and a, a werewolf, according to Victor's information. Okay, from Jeff Nadalny's channel. And I highly suggest you guys go check out Jeff Nadalny's channel. He does great, great work. This is a picture from a tele a, a movie called Dog Soldiers. But again, uh, with the dog soldiers, they these are the costumes they did for the movie. But they did a fantastic job. Notice it still has more of a human-shaped body, yet has kind of a big mane around the neck and still has a, a large dog head on it. You know, this would be more akin to a werewolf as opposed to a dog man. Okay. So just just throwing some of that out there. And let's see. We're going to swing back to some tracks here. Notice these are keys on the right next to a track in the snow. Here's a, another track uh, that somebody used a shotgun shell. Uh, I don't know if it's 20 gauge or 12 gauge, but you get a little bit of a scale for the, the image. Here's another one. Person puts their hand down. Snow makes just fantastic tracks, especially when it's not deep like this and you can see the under undergrowth. Um, Here's some tracks, large tracks next to, next to a vehicle track. Uh, this is what you do not want to see peeking in your window, <laughs> which would basically be two almost glowing eyes with some silhouette of something huge. Often leaning down to look in, notice the pointed ears, which is absolutely terrifying. Same thing, you look outside and you see just some kind of a you know massive head wolf or, or, or canine with glowing eyes peering back at you, you know. Here's a depiction of one. Now, the story I heard with this one was this jumped on the back of someone's car when they were going down the road. It's hard to make that out. I don't know if that's actually what it is, but that's what I heard when I found this one, you know, this image of a dog man. One thing that's important to note, their hands are very raccoon-like. It looks a lot like a raccoon, which raccoons have very human-looking hands but still creepy and long, all right? This is a trail camera, and look at this. Uh, this person didn't know what they found on their trail camera, but they put this out, and they're like, what the heck is this? And it's in Alabama, all right? But look at that. That would be a dog man, all right? Okay, uh, you've probably all heard about this story. Dog-like creature photographed outside a zoo in Texas, right? So here's some footage of that. This is a, a camera, security camera, caught this creature on a zoo outside of Texas. And you can see this, this bipedal creature that, for lack of a better word, looks like a, it looks like a dog man, werewolf type creature. It's hard to make it out completely, but you get the idea. You get the notion. It's crazy. Um, this is from a CCT camera in Brazil, all right, in the streets of Brazil. And you can see this creature, again, with the backward honks legs. It has a tail. This would be a dog man, all right? Now, dog man can be upright or they can go, they can move on all fours and they can move at high speeds. Here's a dog man uh, standing behind a pole. One thing that's funny about these creatures, they often stand behind trees and poles. Bigfoots do this too. And they, they think like, they think they're, they're hidden because they're behind this pole. The problem is they're massively larger than the poles, so they're not hiding anything, but they think they're hiding. That's that's something that's kind of funny. Anyway, back to the uh, back to the movie of Dog Soldiers, which if you haven't seen that, that's a fantastic movie. Low budget film, but great job. Anyways, so this is one of the prop creatures from that movie, and it's terrifying. Um, I showed this one already. I showed this one already, and I showed that one already. Here's another image, kind of an artist rendition of what a werewolf would look like as opposed to a dog man. The ears tend to be more on the side of the head. Uh, um, like, like the ears tend to be more kind of like on the side like this, whereas the, the dog men, the ears tend to protrude more and are more pronounced, whereas on the werewolf, they tend to be on the side more and, and kind of lower, more inconspicuous a little bit, more like this one, as opposed to staying it's just straight up on top of the head. This is from a museum in London. 
all right, in England. Um, and this would be a head of a werewolf. This would not be a dog man. This would be a werewolf. Notice that the, the muzzle on this creature is not as protruded out as far as uh, a dog man would be, the snout on a dog man. Um, and here's a, uh, another image of this werewolf. Notice the ears are farther back. And again, um, it still has a protruded uh, muzzle, but it's not as pronounced or as long as a, uh, as a dog man. So this is a side view of the werewolf. Notice again the ears. They're not on top of the head. They're not pointed straight up. Uh, and again, the muzzle is not as protruded. Now, in the same, the same uh, the museum, this would be a dog man. All right. This is a this is a corpse skeleton of a dog man. Again, notice how protruded the the muzzle is. It's much longer. Okay. Um, this one. Uh, was mentioned by Hunter in the last episode I did. That's why I pulled up these these images, which are fantastic images. I mean, this is that's just amazing. It's hard you'll be hard pressed to find better images of of what these creatures are, and especially what a what what a werewolf would be versus a dog man. Again, according to Victor's information. Now, some differences between a werewolf and a dog man. Okay. We already talked about some of the physical characteristics, all right? Now, that said, a dogman and a werewolf, uh, Victor said that they didn't share the same DNA. They both had human DNA, but the other part of the DNA was not connected. They were completely different species between the dogman and the werewolf. The werewolf, according to Victor, is, mo is more intelligent and it's stronger than a dogman. Even though the dog man has, you know, vicious teeth, you know, uh, and that long, you know, almost crocodile like snapper, mm -hmm. the the dog man uh, would not stand a chance in a fight against a werewolf. A werewolf is just it's more agile, it's faster, it's stronger and it's more intelligent. All right. So it's smart. Now, the flip side of that is uh werewolves travel alone they said they can be seen with a mate maybe a a, a, a youngling for lack of a better word right um but uh but otherwise they're they travel alone they're they're solitary all right they're nomadic whereas the dog man they almost always travel in packs like wolves and a lot of times those packs can be like three to five is is very common but you can have larger packs and there have even been cases of super packs and like, like just like ungodly numbers. <laughs> and uh, whenever that happens and it has happened, according to, again, according to Victor, that's why I did that show. So I can use Victor as a source um, for material. And uh, not everyone believes in Victor's material or as a, as a source, but that's why I did a whole show trying to prove, th I think three or four, times we proved uh some of his stories were correct that doesn't mean i believe all his stuff like him you know fighting a dog man one-on-one -on -one, him dying and coming back to life like multiple times <laughs> uh him running across four states like it's nothing you know i mean the, there's some things I, I struggle with the stories but some of the accounts he's given we have been able to verify and I believe, I'm not exactly sure, I think three or four we did in the last episode that I, I aired. But since then, I've been able to confirm two more, two more cases that, that give credibility to Victor's stories. And they're pretty good. They're pretty good. I'm working on trying to get a uh, guest on to uh, to basically help me confirm that, that uh that that has the ability to confirm these stories so i'm working on that fingers crossed so it's in the works but anyway back to the story so differences between dog men and werewolves okay so a werewolf is stronger than a dog man but a dog man is in packs so it has greater numbers so that kind of creates kind of a balance between the two if you will all right now uh, dog men tend to be more aggressive. Uh, the werewolf being more intelligent is a little more discerning. 
whereas a dog man's not always discerning or just decides it knows better than doing something, but it just does it because it's mad, it's angry, or it's hungry, and just doesn't care at the time, and then may pay the price later kind of thing. Uh, I would much rather run into a werewolf than I would a dog man um, because, uh, because it has more reasoning ability. The other is just more aggressive and vicious, just, just for the sake of being aggressive and vicious, you know, so... Uh, plus, there's more of them. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's some of the characteristics of, of these creatures. And um, let's see what else. Their eye color is different. One of them has yellow eye shine or like an amber eye shine, whereas the other one has like a red eye shine. Now, here's one thing. Victor always says one has one and one has the other. But when I've heard many eyewitness accounts, they often say the opposite of the eye shine. So that kind of throws me off a little bit, but they all say amber or red for the most part. There are some others that say that they saw blue or, you know, a few other colors, but most often times it's going to be amber or red. Uh, they have hands like humans. Okay. They've got shoulders like humans. Um, these are some distinctive characteristics on both of them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that covers most of that. Oh, there's one other thing. Um, according to Victor, the werewolf actually has a type of vocal cords similar to ours. And it can actually, and they, in the programs where they claim that they breed these things and use them for super soldier programs, and we're going to get into some of that, I promise you. Um, in those programs, he claims that they actually teach them like English and stuff like that. So he says it's not uncommon that you could actually run into a werewolf and that it actually speaks to you, which I'm sure is, is, um, you know, completely unnerving. <laughs> but that said, um, he says they have the ability to talk. Now it wouldn't sound like a normal conversation. It would sound like, you know, if, if like, you know, I, I'm speaking broken Spanish, I can get by with my Spanish to where you understand what I'm saying, but I certainly don't sound like I'm educated or fluent in Spanish. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like that. It would be difficult, but you can have a degree of communication. Now, Victor claims with the dog men, they do not have vocal cords uh, like we do. So they cannot speak. However, he does say that they do have a way to communicate. And he kind of chuckles when he says that. Now, my theory on that is they're telepathic and they can communicate telepathically. Whenever I interview witnesses, I always ask them, what did you feel? What was, what, did you hear anything in your mind? I always ask them that when they have the encounters, because they always say that. Uh, multiple ones have said, ha ha ha, I've got you and there's nothing you can do about it. And the, multiple people are saying, that's what I heard in my head. I don't know if it was my imagination or what, you know, uh, which is out of the realm in that type of situation, but still, it's interesting that multiple people are saying that. All right. Another thing that's worth bringing up. Um, also, when it comes to telepathic communication, I claim all of us have the ability of telepathic communication. It's not some kind of a cult thing. It's not sci-fi. It's not like crazy psychic stuff. We are all born with the ability to uh, be have some degree of telepathic communication with each other. Okay, um, a lot of times in the in the government in the programs they call this in intuition. They don't call it ESP or psychic ability. They call it intuition. Now, among intuition, there's also empaths, which is empathic. Um, you can feel someone's emotions. Okay. On, on a uh, intuitive level, all right? That, that would be an intuitive empath. So with these creatures, if you were getting a, a communication, it might not be a word communication in the sense that we communicate, but you can feel the feeling. You can feel the emotion. And if that joker is wanting to kill you, you're going to feel it. You're going to piss in your pants is what you're going to do. That's what most witnesses say happens. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame them. I probably would too. I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I'm some super tough badass because it's not true. I try, but uh, 
I can certainly handle myself more than probably most, but I'm no super badass and I wouldn't be in that situation either. Um, and I hope to not be in it. Although I, at the same time, I would like to put eyes on these things, but I recommend no one ever try to go looking for them. All right. They are dangerous and people do die. Um, it's not a game. This is reality. And that's part of the reason I do this show is to try to warn people uh, because I don't want people getting hurt. And there are innocent people that are being hurt. And we'll swing back to that. So let's move on a little bit. There are reports of a third kind. Now, um, you got some shows that say, oh, you've got this variant and this and this and this. I don't get into all that. I don't know who came up with that crap. Somebody put that out. And then a lot of people just kept repeating it. And it became like a thing. I don't, I don't buy into that. But there are some differences in kinds. One is there seems to be one that resembles a hyena, not just with the face, but also like with the spots. All right. Now, I've heard some people say that that could just be a juvenile uh, dog man, if you will. But it does seem like there is some type of a hyena kind. I've heard multiple reports. Here's an actual photograph. Now, it's a little fuzzy, but this to me strikes me as the hyena kind in this photograph um uh, uh I, I don't know man this thing just terrifies my soul when i see this picture i mean just the picture scares the crap out of me in fact like uh you know i mean can you imagine seeing something like that in the and you're alone in the woods or something or you, you see that staring in your window or something insane another thing that people say most commonly and this is also from a movie this is from van helsing uh, which is a great movie. I love Van Helsing. I love Kate Beckinsale, who, by the way, I met Kate Beckinsale one time. And uh, that was fantastic. <laughs> she was amazing and a gorgeous. Love her. Anyway, um, and also I'm a big fan of Hugh Jackman. And I tell you what, I worked in Hollywood a little bit. And um, one thing uh, that, that people in the know that work with Hugh Jackman, you know, um, People that worked with him on set and crew and all that, they say you couldn't work with a, a more a nicer guy uh, who's more professional, who's on time. They know their lines. They don't show up drunk. They don't show up late. They don't show up with an attitude. Always nice, always kind. Hugh Jackman, that's he's the man. So like, if if I ever had the ability, I would do anything I could to to work with with that man. There's a lot of stars I, I could care less about, uh, many of them, just to, to be true. But but Hugh Jackman, he's a great one. But anyway, back to uh, the movie Van Helsing. And if you haven't seen that, that's a great movie. But anyway, this is one type of dog man that people say that they see the most common. A lot of times when people claim they've seen him, they say, oh, it's just like, just like in the movie. Um Van Helsing with Hugh Jackman. That's another image of a werewolf uh, from Van Helsing. So I just wanted to throw those in there just because of that. Here's an image of something in the woods. Again, notice the pointed ears. That's not something you want to see. And this almost is even worse. You just see kind of a silhouette of a creature with these just glowing eyes. And it almost looks like it's got a mouth open that's kind of growling at you. You know, here's a, one of the, the more popular pics online about a, a dog man somebody took a uh, little fuzzy another one in a wood line again notice the pointed ears not something you want to see they they try to stay just out of out of sight where all you're seeing is a silhouette here's a, a better image of of one where you can make it out a lot more notice it's upright notice the hands um, more like human this would absolutely be a dog man Ears protruded more pronounced on the top. The muzzles more pronounced. Um, and uh, I've got one of my favorite pictures that I found. Uh, I'll swing back to later. This is, there's historical accounts of, of, of a civilization of humanoids that uh, were, were intelligent dog-headed beings. And there's accounts of this. So I throw this up. Uh, to to talk about that, and they had a name for them, which I always struggle with. Here it is: the cynocenophile. Um, I don't know. Now, I think I'm butchering that. Cynocenophile. Okay, the dog-headed man. And there are historical accounts of this. Uh, here it is again uh, on a mural. 
uh, that depicted these creatures in the conversation. There's murals where they had fights, wars, basically, between humans and these, these dog creatures. Um, some claim in the stories of St. Christopher that he was actually one of those creatures. All right. That's a common story you hear a lot. Now, I will add to that. The Catholic Church actually removed St. Christopher as being like a, uh, a saint of the church because they don't have enough documents to really support the um, basically the rumors of the of the of the the, the legend, so to speak. Um, that doesn't mean people who have a devotion can't you know continue that kind of thing, but it just means that we don't know enough about him. So I don't know if it's true that he was that or not. Okay, here's some more uh, tracks, and and here of course we got a tape measure that's showing uh, the scale. Here's another one um, that can be quite large. Here's something crazy I found. This was off of this woman's channel on YouTube on TikTok when I love her channel. She's fantastic. But this is supposed to be a ranger. You can see it says ranger on the side of it, a forest ranger's truck that something with giant nails slashed the entire side of the truck. That is scary crazy. I mean, that's insane. Look at that. Look at that. Forest Ranger truck. And by the way, there's all kinds of stories of Forest Rangers. All right. Telling like um, uh, another one I just mentioned recently was the on uh, Jody Cook with North American Dog Man Project. I've got one of his DVDs he put out where they interviewed a uh, Forest Ranger in the LBL. And he witnessed a dog man attack in the middle of broad daylight that killed a young couple in front of him. And, um, and he wanted to get that off his chest before he died. So, um, that's, uh, that's some craziness, but there's a lot of stories you won't find them. I think there's a reason why like force agents, they're all federalized. And I think there's a reason for that. And that's so that they can keep kind of more of a lid on this kind of stuff because there are a lot of accounts in, uh, in national parks of these creatures, uh, being out there. Okay. Uh, and, and two, I refer you to, uh, David Polites, who's done a masterful job on his four one one. Now he was always very anti the theory of dog man. However, I, some of his material and movies, I mean, it sounds exactly like a dog man, you know, just, just crazy. But that said, um, somebody told me that he's starting to come around on that theory. So I don't know exactly. All right, I'm going to show some other stuff that's semi-related, but helps make the overall point here that I want to get across to you, to you, everybody. And I'm going to have to read this from my phone because it's so hard for me to read this stuff on the screen. I can't, I can't read it, but I'm just going to, I'm going to scan through a little bit of this. Okay, so this says transhumanism and genetic super soldiers. Ooh, okay, ooh, big topic there. So I need to sit for this one. Non-alcoholic. That's bad. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I claim that these creatures came from the past. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, so I'm going to back up real quick. I explained that you've got the Nephilim, and they created the Chimera. Fallen angels created the Nephilim, the Nephilim created the Chimera, right? And they were mostly wiped out by the flood. There are some accounts of creatures that survived the flood in one I accidentally clicked on here too early before, and that was right here. Uh, for only Og, Deuteronomy 311, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Uh, all right. So basically what that saying is he was supposedly the only giant that survived the flood. And I'll be talking more about him and his story uh, later because it's really interesting. And also it was a big piece to all this, this puzzle. Oh. One thing I, I, I forgot to mention earlier because uh, I got sidetracked was remember how I said God started a war between the Nephilim giants and they killed off each other for the most part. And then God created the flood, Noah's flood, to wipe out all the rest. That's how it worked. All right. Now, Rob Skiba's theory was as they died in this war and and they became, uh, uh, you know, a a disembodied spirit or soul uh rob skiba had a theory that 
they started creating this chimera race so that they could create a soulless creature that the demons could then re-inhabit, not as a human, but as a monster. And, and in a way, forestall God's judgment until the flood. All right. So that was one theory. And that's a great that's a great theory um, for for what happened. I don't know if that uh, it, to me, I, I, I don't I bet some of it was that probably not all of it. I would I would I would guess or theorize myself. Um, but that's why I say there definitely is a spiritual component to this whole thing. And I'll try to swing back again to that later. People who encounter these things, there is a spiritual I guess I'll just address it now. There is a very spiritual element to these things. Um, they seem ex to be extremely, especially the dog, man. It's, they, there's a very demonic side to these creatures. It's like they get off on terrorizing you. All right. And they're very vindictive, almost like kind of the gremlin notion, you know, the gremlin mentality, how like vindictive the, the gremlins were. It's my little, my little gremlin. <laughs> um, but, uh, People have had nightmares after encountering these creatures and having having eyewitness encounters. Um, and they talk about these strange nightmares that they have where they're tormented in their nightmares. Now, part of that could be a degree of PTSD. All right. I'm sure it is. But so it go, it seems to go beyond that. It's like there's actual haunting or terror going on. Um, and some of the way these creatures act. They, they seem to be more spiritual than physical. Now, I believe these creatures are physical, but they can certainly have a spiritual side to them. And, and here's another example of that many people that claim that they were in Satanism and the occult and did rituals. They said that when they summon demons, many of them look like dog men and they look like werewolves. So that tells you a lot right there. You know what I'm saying? Plus, think of it, too. You had like the deities of the dead in the Egyptian culture you know, like Anubis, right? So there's something to that too, all right? They also depict uh, dogmen as being soldiers, like guards for temples and stuff. I'm sure that was very common. Um, in fact, there's, I've heard reports of satanic uh, cult organizations where they actually use uh, dogmen as like a security. So, so no one's dropping in on their secret stuff that they don't want witnessed by anybody. Uh, I've heard a few stories of that, never encountered it. So um, I can just go off of the, the story I'm told. Um, but another thing that's crazy about that, the, the, that war, uh, going back to that war amongst the Titans. All right. And the Titans depict a different type of giant than pre-flood and post-flood. They're smaller post-flood pre-flood. And, and again, I you know I, I think you know evolution is Darwinism and it's all it's all buckus all right but uh, it's not pre it's not prehistoric it's pre flood that's the difference that's the separation not it's not prehistoric pre flood the pre flood giants the Bible tells us and in, uh, in other sources that they could be three four hundred feet tall I mean insanely huge giants whereas post flood they could be twenty to forty feet tall but nowhere near being a hundred feet tall. Like that image I showed before, there was a uh, Joseph Flavius that I have his book sitting right here. I always mention. he talked about in first century Jerusalem and he's a credible historian that said that they had a display like this in the old city of Jerusalem. It was a hundred foot tall human skeleton of a Nephilim that was on display in the old city of Jerusalem in the first century. All right. So that's, um, that's huge. And that, that's a real account of history, too. So I've done shows on the Giants. So, um, you know, just recapping, you, you, you get the idea. But one thing that's real interesting that, that uh, Rob Skiba pointed out, when God started the war amongst the Giants in, in before the flood, the war was over like one of the stupidest things in the world. They actually were killing each other and went to war over the fact that some of them chose to be circumcised and others didn't. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, that that just strikes me as hilarious. I mean, I, I don't understand that. I don't I don't get that. But 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 they did, apparently, because they the war that God started amongst the giants where they killed off each other was half got circumcised and half didn't. <laughs> That's just insane. And then later on, what's interesting is 
So I mentioned all King of Bashan who survived the flood. Well, you've got Nimrod, who's a giant who built the Tower of Babel, and he's important a whole story. I'll do entire shows on him later. But that said, Nimrod was a giant who built the Tower of Babel, and all King of Bashan, those two fought against each other. Like, they hated each other. And, and Og, King of Bashan, made fun of Nimrod because he said he was circumcised. <laughs> so they're carrying the war all the way past the, the flood, you know, the same, the same strife. Uh, you got stiff, dude. You got to go. <laughs> I mean, that's just crazy. Anyway, I don't know. I don't get it. But, um, but it's interesting to note. Uh, and moving on, let's see where it was. I? Okay, so back to our, oh. So we covered the origin of cryptids. That in in a in a macro sense or overgeneralized, oversimplified. I'm hitting the high peaks here, right? Just for the sake of brevity, this can't be like ten hours long, right? Um, but that said, so the ancient times and the fallen angels, the Nephilim created the Chimera. The flood wiped out most of them. Now, then you have what's called the second incursion theory, and there's four leading scholarly. Examples of the second incursion theory. One was that some giants in Chimera survived, like all King of Bashan. Another was that um, human DNA was corrupted. And uh, so Noah and his sons were pure, but they took wives before entering the ark and their DNA was not pure. So in times later, we see in the Canaanites in the in the in the Philistines where giants started coming like uh, David and Goliath. Right. So um, that's interesting. Now, Nimrod was special because the Bible says he became a mighty Gaborim, which means he became a mighty man. So it's almost like he altered his DNA or something in order to become a, a Nephilim or a giant. He says he was two parts uh, God and like one part human. Um, so that that's really interesting. But anyway, so you get these creatures from the old times. And I believe that today, remnants like Bigfoot, like Goatman, which are still seen today. And like I said, they're mentioned in the Bible four times. Um, so Goatman, Bigfoot, and Dogman, just not as well known to the common public. I think these are all just remnants from the pre-flood days. In one form or another, they are all the chimera that came from the fallen angels and the Nephilim. And to that, as we already pointed out, Jesus says, as they were in the days of Noah, they will be again at the end. They will return. And I think we're seeing that return now in a greater way than we have before. So these were created in ancient times. Well, now you fast forward to the Nazis and Hitler. Hitler uh, was obsessed with occult knowledge and ancient esoteric knowledge that he believed could give him power or be used weaponized to give him strength and power and uh, a military edge over over his competition, if you will. Okay, Hitler, um, we know for an absolute fact that Dr. Mangala, Nazi under Hitler, a very evil person, did all kinds of insane, like just just turns my stomach insane scientific experiments to human beings just to just to see what the result would be you know what i mean like they just they did unspeakable things i don't I, it just turns my stomach to even think about it. it what they did to humans children i mean just just crazy the innocent people but anyway that said we know that uh, he actually talked about trying to work on a super soldier program they called the uber mention the Uber mentioned the Superman. Okay. And they had a super soldier program. He was trying to mix ape and human DNA. All right. Like, um, like the, the, the new movies coming out of, of, you know, Charlton Heston's old film of Planet of the apes. All right. That they're remaking for like the umpteen time again. Now, <laughs> Hey, and here's something else worth mentioning on this topic is you remember Jesse Ventura with his show that he had, called Conspiracy Theory, ran years back. He did a fantastic job on that show, by the way. And I listen, I, I listened to him one time talk about all the hell he had making those shows. He's like, man, they would only air the shows at the worst possible times when no one watches like TV. And he said, and it still had like 
the highest ratings, you know, <laughs> but they were trying to hide it and still was like getting like just tremendous views. But anyway, he did a story one time in Georgia of a facility, modern day, that was mixing open about mixing human and ape DNA to create some type of, of, of chimera to this day in Georgia. Uh, uh, so that's crazy. Um, and I'll show you to that effect since I brought that up. If I can find my story, here we go. Booyakasha. Bam. So Senate kills GOP legislation to prohibit certain human animal chimeras. What? <laughs> so what this is saying is they try to pass a law in Congress to say it's it, what used to be illegal to create human animal chimeras. All right. But the government's basically repealed that law. So now you can create humans spliced with animals. And by the way, they've been doing this secretly underground in labs since like the 40s and 50s. Like, no joke. Imagine the kind of stuff that they've perfected in all those years. This is just for the normal scientists and regular people on the surface that, that have to follow laws. You know, they don't have to follow laws at, at dumbs at deep underground military bases. It's one of the reasons they do it. And they hide all their stuff from the public. But... This is important because the government, this is actual proof that our government is involved in human, mixing human and animal DNA to create chimeras. And, and you got to understand, it's not just human and animals. I mean, they're, they're mixing human and spiders, human and, and goats, human and, and plants. I mean, anything that they can. Um, and I've heard in some of these facilities that they that they mix, they got these gene splicing guns that can just do like millions of combinations just to see what happens in a relatively short time. But anyway, you get the idea. Now, what's interesting about this story, when this came out publicly a few years back, I found a story in Parliament in England voted on the same thing. And they also voted to be able to do human animal mixing DNA chimeras. So that's insane. Now, um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm gonna swing back to Hitler real quick and then come back. So like I said, Dr. Mangala, we know was mixing human and animal DNA and they were doing super soldier programs, the Uber mentioned, right? The Superman. Uh, and, and another thing about Hitler, Hitler was obsessed with wolves and werewolves, like obsessed. If you study his stuff, he was obsessed with that stuff. He named his number one U-boat the Wolf. It was named the Wolf. Right? That shows you a little bit of that. He created a special forces unit of normal human beings, gifted but normal human beings, and he called them the werewolves. All right? He called them the werewolves. I absolutely believe they were working on not just human and ape experiments, but also I think he found out about these creatures being real from our ancient past. And I think he was trying to find a way to weaponize them or to manipulate DNA to create super soldiers. Now, I don't think they got super far in that technology before they got destroyed by allied powers. But here's the kicker. We all know that it came out during the Nuremberg trials that you had Project Paperclip. And Project Paperclip, all right, talked about how uh, the U.S. made an under-the-table deal with, like, I think, like over 2,000 Nazi scientists that they could escape the hangman's noose in Nuremberg, which is just a show trial, just to say, oh, we did something for what y'all did to us kind of thing. Uh, and then we hired all those scientists to come to the United States and work for us, oftentimes doing the exact same evil satanic experiments. And that, by the way, gets us into adrenochrome. All right. You've heard about that. All right. Uh, you, I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, but uh, it, that came out of those programs as well. And so that tells you what they were doing to people and children. Okay. So I'll leave it at that. Anyway, um, the two leading things that they were trying to get out of project paperclip 
was number one propulsion design all right and again that can be easily viewed with Werner von braun that headed up jpl the precursor to modern nasa all right nazi scientists who created the v2 rocket all right that that uh, uh attacked england in, in world war ii he was a genius an absolute genius i got showed pictures before with him with Ken, president kennedy and all this kind of stuff but anyway number two they wanted to know about mind control, right? How to pick the human brain apart and dissect it like a computer so that you know how to program people, even against their will or knowledge, to do what they want, their agendas. And that became commonly known as MK Ultra. MK Ultra. Now, MK Ultra is damn frightening. If you don't know about that, go look it up. Um, now, MK Ultra, which started out as like one program, split into thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of other programs, all right, including the Maturian Candidate, which Denzel Washington made a movie about. And, you know, that's real. I don't know how much I should go into that kind of stuff, but I could blow your mind with some stuff on that. And I, I might try to save that for another show because I think it deserves it just for people to understand. One thing you've got to understand about this topic as well as other topics that I cover. Many times there's going to be many people who are like, John, this stuff's BS. You're a conspiracy theorist, blah, 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 blah. And that's why I always use the quote from Plato, that you can't know something you don't already know. And that just simply means the way the human brain works with knowledge. Our government controls what we're allowed to believe and what we are not allowed to believe. Your work, your job, your office, your peers, all of that is structured in that. For example, if you were a medical doctor, you are not allowed to do homeopathic medications. You have to do what you were taught in medical school and what all your peers and what all your professors have told you to do to diagnose medicine. Medicine today is not really about getting healing yourself. It's about getting you hooked on a uh, product for, you know, uh, pharmaceutical industries, you know. <clears throat> Sadly, many doctors today are just drug pushers for big pharma. And, you know, it used to be that the rule in medicine was, the rule in medicine was not only do no harm, all right, the, the Hippocratic Oath, but which I don't even know if they even take that anymore because they certainly don't follow it. So, but um, but another thing is that the our number one rule of medicine always was don't treat the symptoms, treat the disease. Well, I can tell you in modern medicine today, they don't treat the cause of disease. They only cover the symptoms. You know, if you get sick with some kind of chronic illness, they're going to give you things to treat the symptoms. They're not going to give you things to cure the disease. And they don't want to. Now, your doctor may be a good, smart, intelligent, and good-hearted person who wants you to get better. The problem is they're brainwashed. And they're brainwashed by a very tight system of control that, can, that they're only allowed to think one way. And that's the way that they're taught. That's why we have accreditation and all this stuff so that they can be controlled. Thank you, Rockefellers. All right. But that said, uh, he might have the best of intentions, but all they're doing today is treating the symptoms, not the disease. For example, if you have high blood pressure, okay, well, let's put you on statins, right? Uh, well, wait a minute, statins, you know, um, what about treating what actually, how to reverse heart disease? You know what I mean? We don't go there. You get uh, insulin resistance. Well, now you got to, you know, you got to take medication for that for the rest of your life. Well, wait a minute. How do we, what's causing this, number one? And then how do I address that and fix it, number two, without being dependent on medication for the rest of your life? You see what I'm saying? So those are just two small examples. Another one, I've had a lot of family die and um, I'm no fan of, of chemo because it destroys the immune system, you know? Um, uh, now, people, I'm not telling people what to do. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not advising you, um, and I'm not trying to be, but it it strikes me as odd that that people that take that, it, it hurts the immune system, 
you know, um, as opposed to strengthening the immune system. But again, I'm not a doctor and I'm not trying to give medical advice. I'm just saying, I think there's a problem with our system today. And I see more people getting sick than getting better. And people who get sick with chronic disease, they don't, um, they don't, they don't seem to get better. So uh, they just slowly with the system just gets slowly worse over time. And I think there's a, I think there's things we need to do to try to fix that. You know, I think, I think it's, it's important to have alternative, uh, you know, views. In fact, that's another thing of medicine that people don't realize in science, science and medicine was always about arguing positions and disagreeing with mainstream positions and everything else. That's always been a part of, of medicine. Anyway, digress. Um, getting back to, uh, so Hitler found out about these, these super soldier programs, or he was trying to create a super soldier program after he found out about the existence of these creatures. Nuremberg trials, the project paperclip, the U S brought these scientists over here and we continue these experiments, including the super soldier experiment. So since the forties and fifties, our government's trying to create super soldiers. So when they found out about these creatures being real, what do you think our government started doing? Same thing Hitler did with Hitler's own scientists. So with that, let's get back into this. Transhumanism and genetic super soldiers. With the rapid advancements in the field of, of genomes and gene modification, a very real possibility arises. And these technolog technologies could be applied to enhance a soldier's physical capabilities. Okay. And it goes into more explanation of that next. Um, so now it talks about DARPA and how DARPA is involved in this program. Uh, Russia at the bottom also says is involved in this program. I'm going to skim through these pretty fast. Now here's another one. The U S military is creating a generation of super soldiers, which have been genetically modified given uh, and this one talks about technological implants. And again, it refers to DARPA. Um, and it talks about, too, like these programs talk about how much money they spend in these programs. Like it's just, it's just enormous, billions and billions of dollars. DARPA is working on a host of impressive projects that could lead to superhuman abilities. DARPA spent around $70 million in research, the role of neural networks to play in the operating in the brain's in order to decipher how it processes sensory input, all right? We hear Elon talking about that kind of thing a lot, especially with his Neuralink technology. Um, here, again, talking about DARPA and the many of the things it goes into, you can pause on these and read them for yourself. I've got the source at the bottom, all right? Again, DARPA also work on technologies outside of the body to make their super soldiers stronger, faster, okay? Soldiers having no physical, uh, psych, uh, physiological or cognitive limitations will, uh, will be key to survival and operational dominance in the future. All right. Now, here's I like this one because this breaks down. What are some of the qualities are, are, we're looking for in a super soldier program? One, bulletproof clothes made of carbon uh, chain mail. All right. Or other materials. The, the idea is bulletproof bulletproof armor of some type to synthetic blood. All right. That's uh, you bleed out on a battlefield uh, from loss of blood uh, and blunt force trauma more than anything else. So being able to preserve blood coming out is a major part of, of surviving. Okay. Look at the next one. Seven foot leaps in 25 mile an hour sprinting. All right. So they want something that can leap really high and can sprint and run for very long distances, especially at high speed for maybe a shorter distance. Pain, uh, pain retardedness, you know, uh, freedom from sleep doesn't require as much sleep as, as a normal soldier. Oh, oh, look at the next one. Look at the next one. Telepathy. Who? Oh, gee, where have I heard that before? You see what I'm saying? There's a connection between the, the, the telepathy, and that's what I said, and, and now you might understand where I'm going with this, right? So another one, exoskeleton, that just means that you've got armor on the outside as opposed to bones on the inside. Um, 
climbing gloves and shoes. So to be able to, you know, go over, you know, big surfaces. Now, if you look at all those critiques, now I'm sure they're, they're, they're doing just like this. You see this little picture above, they're working on soldiers where they can create these exoskeleton suits that enhance human uh, ability. But also in this super soldier program, I claim this is also a checklist for the dog man, uh, werewolf weaponized programs. So just like Hitler, our government has, has captured some of these creatures. They have a breeding facility and they train them for super soldier programs. And they want creatures that can feed themselves in the field and don't need supply lines, can run for huge distances, can pick up large, heavy objects that could jump over large objects that uh, don't need as much rest or sleep, that have telepathic abilities. You see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going with this? So um, that's where I'm saying we have a super soldier program. And this is one part of it. The, the dog men, the werewolves, they're one part of the super soldier program there's others that it's just enhancing humans uh and we'll get into a little bit more of that but it all it all connects together right and that's that's what we're getting to so in the next one rumors about american giants from u.s army base in south korea um is has just been confirmed thanks to this incredible footage obtained by such and such Military Humvee height is at six feet, almost two meters. So right here, you've got a giant uh, walking in formation in front of this tank. Now, um, these videos have been uh, kind of scrubbed. A lot of videos have been scrubbed, right? But um, let's take a little breaky real quick and check this out. The idea is that we're going to take the capabilities of some of the fittest, highest performing individuals in the world, these infantry guys that you were just talking about, and we're going to extend those capabilities. We're going to make them stronger, we're going to make them last longer, and we're going to make them go faster and farther. We're going to take them that extra mile. I know where I am in space. I can tell other people where I am in space. I can transmit that information about where I am in space. I can sense what the soldier is doing. I can sense the motion. I can tell whether he's on the deck or he's standing up. I can tell whether they're sweating profusely. I can tell whether the heart rate is too high. I can tell what We're going to focus on mechanical means to go ahead and increase the capability of human beings. There's a man-machine interface, and that man-machine team is basically what you're looking at here. We took the system out uh, to AP Hill. We put some Army operators in the system. Um, at the beginning of the day, when guys were fresh, uh, the soldier knocked out 26 repetitions, lifting a 185-pound barbell doing squats. And then at the end of the day, after we'd, we traversed miles, the guys had run up and down five flights of stairs. The, they had uh, navigated underground through a, a culvert, a tunnel, for uh, half a mile, something like that, uh, in full mop gear. Um, so these guys were tired at the end of the day. When the guy put this system on, got underneath that barbell and knocked out 72 repetitions, that pretty much told us everything that we needed to know. It's remarkable how much more energy this system has provided. And that's everything you need to know about that dude. <laughs> um, so again, on the same lines as that. Would it be possible someday to create superheroes using genetic engineering? In the comic book X-Men, superheroes carry the X-Gene, which gives them their mutant abilities. Such a gene doesn't exist in humans, as is purely fictional. Humans, however, do possess skills that appear to be like superhuman abilities. For example, Tim Dreyer of Johannesburg, South Africa, has a genetic mutation that makes his bones denser than normal. 
Scott Flansberg from New York is described as a human calculator with the ability to calculate numbers in his head at a lightning speed. Stephen Pete of Washington State has a genetic mutation in the SCN9A gene and subsequently doesn't feel any pain. Veronica Seider of Stuttgart, Germany, is believed to have the best eyesight in the world. She's able to identify individuals from a mile away. Despite the rarity of these mutations, there could be a chance to deliberately introduce genetic mutations into humans. For instance, a 2016 study found that muscle growth can be induced by manipulating a gene called ACVR2B. This gene codes with a receptor that inhabits a naturally occurring protein that limits muscle growth. This would allow humans to develop an incredible muscle mass amounting to super strength. Scientists also believe that they can help the visually impaired by giving them ultrasonic hearing, similar to dolphins and bats. They believe that the Preston protein, encoded by the SLC26A5 gene, is key to achieving this superhuman ability. Super speed may also be achieved through the removal of a gene called NCOR1. Scientists found that mice ran twice as fast when they removed their NCO1 gene. The genome editing technology is already being used to repair single gene disorders such as cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease and sickle cell disease. It's possible that humans could someday borrow super strengths from other species. For example, tardigrades are known as the toughest creatures on Earth. They can resist high radiation and survive in the vacuum of space. Scientists genetically engineered human cells to produce a tardigrade protein, which gave human cells the ability to resist radiation by up to 40%. Gene editing techniques may turn the next generation into superhumans by giving them the option to choose their abilities from a catalog. However, this would have to be done at an embryonic state to ensure that all the 37 trillion cells of the adult human are genetically modified. Okay, so back to our guy with the tank, right? Giant with the tank. Now. So, the rumors about American giants from United States Army base in South Korea are just confirmed to be true thanks to this incredible footage obtained by Igor Kryan. Military Humvee height is over 6 feet or almost 2 meters. If you install 4 feet or 1 meter tall HMG on Humvee roof or 50 caliber heavy machine gun like you are seeing here now, the total weight of vehicle would be almost 10 feet or over 3 meters. This soldier towering above the other soldiers and 10 feet Humvee with HMG on top making his height close to 12 feet or 4 meters tall, also making him real Nephilim giants. The military intelligence insiders said they secretly created those Nephilim soldiers in this lab and brought them to South Korea to intimidate North. Average height of North Korean soldiers is only slightly above 5 feet or 1.5 meters. And the United States military intelligence is trying to scare them out of the battle with 12 feet or 4 meters tall giants. But this giant sight also makes them a good target on the battlefield. That's wild. That's a giant. And there's like several photographs of giants, especially working with military personnel. Uh, some emergency events, they've been spotted and photographs have leaked out about them. Here's a TikTok show where a guy is talking about a giant and he also shows a video of, uh, he shows a giant at the mouth of a cave, but then he goes into showing a video of, and now the, the video is a little bit obscured, but what they claim is a giant walking around a tank just like that in the, in the Middle East where this thing's towering way above the size of this tank.
That's crazy, right? Okay, so something else I want to show uh, right on the stem of that is this. Okay, years back, I found not one, but two videos of a ambassador of Syria going public and going before the UN. And he said something that was really cryptic, cryptic, but it caught my attention. And this has been virtually scrubbed from the internet. It took me a very long time to try to find any mention of this footage. Okay. And I found one and I'm going to show that, but just to show you, first of all, and I got a couple of these, but look, it says a Syrian ambassador says that soldiers in Aleppo were genetically modified. We know governments are genetically modifying foods and animals and, and in secret facilities. They're, the ambassador said that they're also modifying soldiers. And he went before the UN to say, I'm begging the UN to stop the US from sending genetically modified soldiers into Assyria and combat zones in our country. What that means is, what he's saying is, these are non human soldiers non human that's what genetically modified whether it's a giant whether it's a dog man or something else these are non human soldiers that that he admitted and on i had two films of him on two occasions talking about this and what happened to those you see right here look right there video unavailable it's been scrubbed it's been scrubbed a lot of stuff's being scrubbed by the reason, one reason they hate TikTok is because you can find a lot of information there that's scrubbed in other places that they don't have as much control over or want you to know. It's about controlling you and knowledge. Plus, there's a lot of pork belly in that uh, system to invade and control you in other ways, too, that they're not talking about. But here's something else I want you to take a look at, and then it's going to go into the ambassador of Syria. Hi, I'm Jerry Davis, and I want to talk to you about ISIS and super soldiers and Christianity and what this means to believers worldwide. I saw a speech a couple of days ago by the Syrian ambassador to the United Nations. And in his speech, which I will show you in just a moment, he spoke of genetically modified soldiers of the United States being inserted into the Middle East to conduct warfare against the Syrian government. And that's a big statement. But he is the ambassador to the United Nations, and he's highly educated, and he wouldn't make that up. There's no point in making things up, so because he'll always be proven false. So I thought, well, maybe ISIS means something that, other than what we think it does. You know, when I think of ISIS, I think of just an Islamic army that was kind of cobbled together by the CIA. But no, it's much more than that. It looks like it's much more than that. Uh, I, I checked out ISIS. I found this website, uh, Gnostic Warrior, G-N-O-S-T-I-C Warrior. And uh, it says, ISIS, goddess of darkness and chaos. And ISIS was uh, a Sumerian goddess and uh, Egyptian goddess. I mean, from way back. And, and no doubt, you know, all these old gods that we just write off as um, fables probably have some basis or roots in demons themselves um, this Isis and this statue is quite complimentary of Isis and she's an, an attractive looking goddess but uh, the uh, Sumerians called her Tiamat the serpent of chaos uh, mother of gods and all abominations of chaos uh, wow you know that's not good and on her head is a bird, and that bird is a vulture. And and the vulture is uh, that's a nasty, disgusting beast that eats the dead. Okay. Uh, and the name Isis means throne or she of the throne, and so it's just all symbolic of of a of a world government and you can look this up and read it yourself and we'll go through all this with you but basically isis was a tremendously evil god a, a world ruler that that ate the dead and created chaos and so things that isis 
did over in the Middle East. Um, th this is a um, Jordanian pilot that they captured. They captured several of them, put them in cages, and set them on fire and recorded it so that we could watch at home from our sofa. This is a Jordanian pilot. And these genetically modified soldiers, apparently, and the military, absolutely, they've got a $2 billion a year program to develop super soldiers that they're bad. You know, it's not, it's not like they're good guys. Um, these are Christians that ISIS killed over in the Middle East. Um, these are Christians that ISIS burned to death, hanging them upside down in fire over in the Middle East. And this is Rick Wiles of True News. This is a 28-minute um, segment. We're going to see about four minutes of that. And it's not near the end. And he's going to talk about the Syrian ambassador. So let's cue this up and... Listen to these really guys talk about it. Weird story. The, the ambassador, the Syrian ambassador to the United Nations, Dr. Bashar Jafari, made a cryptic remark uh, a few days ago at the United Nations. He was talking about that, you know, his nation was being falsely accused, that these were fa false flag, fake chemical attacks. And, you know, so... so you were listening to his comments, and it sounds you know normal what he's saying. But then he he mentioned genetically modified entities. Yes. And I had to stop and rewind and listen to it again, listen to it again, listen to it again. I, I want to play the video again. This is serious ambassador to the United Nations. We're only going to play the part where he's talking about genetically modified somethings in his country. Watch this. We say to Saudi Arabia today that we eliminated its terrorist tentacles in eastern Ghouta, and I mean Jaysh al-Islam gangs. Yes, we say to Qatar and Turkey that we eliminated their terrorist tentacles in eastern Ghouta, and I mean Al-Nusra Front gangs and Faylaq al-Rahman gangs. And I say to all those who exported to us armed, moderate, genetically modified opposition that we eliminated these toxic exports and we call upon those exporters to bear the consequences of their actions as some elements who survived would return to their original countries. All right, Doc. <laughs> we, we've been doing True News a long time. <laughs> this is one of the weirdest things I've ever reported on. Yeah. Did he say that the U.S. or some Western country exported genetically modified soldiers into his country? Yes, he referred to them as chemi chemical weapons. Toxic. Even. Toxic substances in his country. Nephilim. They're Modern Nephilim. Name, that, that's what it would be. That's what we're dealing with. He's talking about Nephilim. The Nephilim are back. This are, isn't the only time he said that either. I mean, he's made that reference before. When did he say it? In 2016, the same ambassador referring again to the jihadists, the ones that Saudi Arabia's put in, other people have been armed. He brought this up in regard to Aleppo. He said that genetically modified fighters are being used and exported into his country. We actually have that clip too. He said this at the United Nations. And this is 2016. 2016. All right, let's watch this one too. The Syrian government is still ready to evacuate remaining unlawful armed groups and the terrorist pockets in the eastern part of Aleppo. And it has organized yesterday a convoy to evacuate 3,750 terrorists and their families. Unfortunately, some member states and the Security Council and the mainstream media continue to defend and support the genetically modified armed Syrian opposition moderate, by definition, while turning a blind eye to the crimes committed by them genetically modified soldiers in the Middle East. The jihadists, he's talking about ISIS. Yes. yes. He, re, he called them genetically modified. I mean, this is, Doc, they're, they're Nephilim. Right. Now, in 2015, ISIS, uh, one of the most shocking 
uh, executions was when ISIS beheaded 21 Egyptian Christian. Coptic Christian men. Right. And I remember a lot of people talking about how tall these men were. Right. Because people were saying, hey, they're not, those aren't uh, Arabs. Uh, they're too tall. They, they, they look like American basketball players. We've got a video. I want to go ahead. We'll show it and we'll just keep talking. But this is what they were referring to that these men look abnormally tall for being uh, Arab soldiers. Right. Clearly taller than their captives. Because you yes. look at the head, the head doesn't even come up to the shoulders of some of these, uh, these soldiers. I mean, you're talking about seven, seven and a half foot tall uh, terrorists here in this video. So now we're talking, think about this. Ha was the ISIS invasion, which came from, I mean, just, it just appeared, ISIS. It just appeared. Right. Nobody had ever heard of ISIS. And they're going through Syrian and Iraqi towns, cutting off people's heads and slaughtering people. Did America produce these creatures in laboratories? Did we grow these things and then turn them loose on the Christians in the Middle East? For dear God, how wicked and evil are we? And for the Syrian ambassador to come out publicly and say something like that, saying these are gen genetically modified entities, soldiers, terrorists, operating in this region. I mean, I was shocked to hear that today. This is the first time I had heard anything about this. Well, you know, months ago, President Putin talked... Yeah. He told students in Russia that, that our, uh, nations were developing super soldiers right. that w would have no fear. Yep, uh, he, he jumped in. That's what I was going to talk about next. So it's not even just the Syrian ambassador that talks about the, the U.S. using these genetically modified soldiers in war zones that he's saying is this is unethical and they need to stop. But also... President Putin, Vladimir Putin, warns of genetic super soldiers, says they're more deadly than nuclear bombs. Boom. How's that for a bomb? All right. Um, so even Putin gave up. This also has been scrubbed uh, from the Internet. Uh, I cannot find. Used to be I could do a two second search and find this and you could hear Putin in his own words say this, but I could not find it. And um, and 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 even the this this video you're just watching is the only one I could find that that talked about the the Syrian ambassador. All the other videos that used to come up, they're all gone. They've all been scrubbed. And and why is that? They don't want you to know. Uh, able to go through all kinds of pain. So this is not. Um, concept it's not even outlandish no no world leaders are openly talking about it folks we we've entered wow. the twilight zone we've entered the last days jesus christ is coming you got to get ready church you got to get ready jesus christ is coming don't be sitting there wait all right that's pretty interesting he's talking about well a lot of things there but he talks about poutine and here it is this is a speech by putin right here And he's talking about the super soldiers, the genetically modified super soldiers. Созданы или природой, или люди с религиозными взглядами говорят Господом Богом. Последствия практически какие из этого могут наступить? What kind of practical? This means that one can already imagine it. One may imagine that a man can create a man with some given characteristics, not only theoretically but also practically. He could be a genius mathematician, a brilliant musician, or a soldier. A man who can fight without fear, compassion, regret, or pain. As you understand, humanity can enter, and most likely it will, in the near future, a very difficult and very responsible period of its existence. And what I've just described might be worse than a nuclear bomb. When we do something, whatever we do, I want to reiterate it again, we must never forget about the ethical foundations of our work. And you know, that's pretty cool.
I don't know who this is, but that's that's pretty cool. This is another short video about genetically modified soldiers, just to give you an idea about the budget. But it talks about these being smarter, sharper, more focused, uh, physically stronger than their enemy counterparts, capable of telepathy, run faster than Olympic champions, lift record-breaking weights through the development of exoskeletons. Eh. That's not might be a qualify for a super soldier, but we're talking about genetically modified soldiers. Hey, thanks for joining me on the 180. Today we're going to look at genetically modified soldiers. Hmm. Is it true? This is the article I posted on my blog, and over here on the 180, we're going to dig a little deeper, so follow me over here. This is uh, SOT.net, Signs of the Time. The article, the U.S. Army, super soldiers, genetically modified humans won't need food or sleep. Uh, let's roll down here a little bit. I want to point something out. Uh, right here, backed by $2 billion a year in funding, the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, recently unleashed the news after years of secret experimentations and study. So right there, they're admitting that they've uh, secretly been experimenting, and since the technology they're talking about is genetically modifying humans, I would assume that they've been testing on humans, but let's keep running here. Here's uh, uh, Press.TV, or Press TV actually. All right. This is a uh, U.S. super soldiers of the future will be genetically modified transhuman capable of superhuman feats. Uh, well, let's scroll down here and see some of those superhuman feats. Mm. Right here. Uh, do you want soldiers that can regrow li lost limbs? I think that would be neat. Um, this one here threw me for a loop. Check this out. Do you want a soldier that can outlift Olympic weightlifters and that can communicate telepathically? <laughs> this implies that they've discovered a gene responsible for telepathic abilities and they're able to manipulate it. Let's keep running here. Uh, mail online, and this is the reason why they're doing it. Okay, and this is the reason, well, at least the cover reason why they're they're doing it. Uh, Army of the future soldiers will be able to run at Olympic speed and won't need food or sleep with gene technology. Like I said, there's reasons here. You just have to scroll down a little deeper. And here, let me start off at the beginning here. Where it says, one area of success has been in shutting off the trigger of sleep. A drug was tested on U.S. Army helicopter pilots that enabled them to stay up longer than 40 hours, with their levels of concentration actually improving after nearly two days without rest. And here's the reason. It is hoped to replace the amphetamine-based drugs that have previously been used to keep servicemen alert during operations. So right there, they're letting us know that apparently servicemen are on amphetamines when they're at war. So. Like I said, these are the articles I cover over here at Experimental Vaccines Daily News. And uh, once again, thanks for joining me here on uh, the 180. And look out for genetically modified people. <laughs> They're coming to a future near you. Yeah, coming to a future near you. Another article says these soldiers will have empathy genes deleted and show no mercy while devoid of any fear, right? There's a famous story in the dog man community of the, in the underground military base that these soldiers were brought in to witness uh, one of these dog men creatures in a, in a cage, um, a face to face kind of thing. And they put a little girl child in the cage with the creature and these military generals and leaders watched as this creature devoured and ripped this little girl into pieces in front of them. And they all viewed that as a success because it did not have empathy. It didn't have empathy. It didn't have mercy. See, they uh, one thing you often hear of, of generals and, and stuff like that in our military programs when they talk about our super soldiers, they're like, there's a problem. These guys think for themselves. They have ethics. They have morality. They don't follow orders. They have empathy. And they want to remove the gene that causes empathy so that they can be cold and heartless and do any order they're told without second guessing it. And that is just the loss of our soul.
the loss of our soul as a country. That's what that is. And people have a hard time wrapping their head around that this kind of stuff could be real, that this that this level of evil could be real. But just as that man pointed out, I, and I refer back to this, as it was in the days of Noah, Jesus Christ said in the New Testament, so it will be again at the end. All right. And then again, going back to Isaiah 13. That's not Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. Uh, God says he's sending the giants to punish his own people for his sins in the future. Future fulfillment. That's now. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be again at the end. That's now. We're seeing the return of the Nephilim. We're seeing the return of the giants. We're seeing the return of the chimera, right? The, the Euphrates River, the waters are drying up. It also tells you the signs of the time and the seasons. That's why my show is called the Harbinger Report, because I'm harping on harbinging about the end times. And the only solution to that is Christ. The only solution to that is Jesus. The only solution to that is not hate, but having love for people, having empathy having morality, having ethics, having a relationship with God and a true relationship with each other. That's the solution to all this, not nightmare stuff. God doesn't want us to live in fear. God wants us to live according to faith, hope, and love. And that's, we're not going to succeed if we don't have that. Now, check this out. Ongoing investigation, but we'll keep you up to date. And finally tonight, werewolf, Bigfoot, missing link, perhaps an elaborate hoax. The people in Taylor, Mississippi would like answers to these very questions. Our own Amber Maddox is in the field to file the story of Horror in the Hamlet. For residents of tiny Taylor, Mississippi, it's the classic case of things that go bump in the night. Strange noises, unexplained shadows, and dogs barking for no reason have become the norm, all associated with what many in the area called the swamp booger. Now I blew it up so you can probably see it a little better. But a recent photo taken by local Tina Bragg may have just substantiated what has long been considered a myth. Now, I reckon you can really see it there. And is that one scary looking something? Look at, look at that mouth. Look at that eye. That ain't your natural dog running around in the bushes. A sudden rash of animal mutilations and strange droppings have many believing that the mysterious creature is anything but a myth. I ain't never seen nothing like that. Aubrey Dale is a cattle farmer and was once skeptical of what he considered a fairy tale. But the discovery of some of his livestock torn apart by an unseen attacker and unexplained feces in his backyard has Mr. Dale rethinking his previous stance. We had some cows tore up in the field, man. There was this, there was this, this stuff on the ground, this, this crap, man. I ain't never seen nothing look like that. Though many in the area believe that this is the work of a Sasquatch, local Billy Teague is convinced this is the work of a creature from Cajun country known as the Lugaroo. Man, mutilating animals, cutting animals' heads off, howling at the moon. That's the Lugaroo, right? And I promise you, the worst is yet to come. For now, local authorities aren't commenting on their investigation, but they are looking into the reports that grow in number with each passing week. For Tina Bragg, the answers can't come soon enough. I, I live by myself, and let me tell you what, I'm going to be some scared somebody until the government or somebody comes down here and does something about this creature that's been terrorizing this town of Taylor. I'm, I'm tired of it, and, uh, you know, everybody else is. And I want to know what it is, and I want it gone. Reporting from Taylor, Mississippi, I'm Amber Maddox for Channel 7 News. Rugaluru. I, I tell the story before. Uh, I, one of the, one of my state trooper buddies I used to work with called me and said, "Hey, man, they got your they got your dog man down the road." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" So I go down there, and it was this Mexican guy selling these signs. And I said, "Where'd you get this?" He says, oh, "I got it in Mexico, and in, uh, in Mexico City." And I said, "Well, why are people in Mexico City making signs like this?" And he says, because they're seeing these creatures down there. They're seeing these creatures. That's what he said. 
Then when you match up the show I did with Sancho, my number two episode, who worked in the drug cartels, and he tells his story about these creatures on the border. I talked to Jody Cook with North American Dogman Project. He said he's talked to federal agents about these creatures on the border. Also, he said some federal agents showed him photographs of some bone structures of these creatures. And he said that the, the bones are like the, the, the bones of the chest was like a, was like body armor. It was like a plate. That's why you hear very often times people that have encounters that shoot at these things. They said it's like plinking a metal target. You just hear plink, 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 and they just bounce off because they, they actually have a skeletal structure that creates like a body armor. So it's hard to phase these, these things. Uh, normal, normal weapons don't, don't really work on these things too, too well or too often. This is one of my favorite photographs that I found. I found this photograph myself of a dog man. Now here's the story behind this photo. It's one of my favorite photos I carry around with me and show people when I'm trying to describe these creatures. First of all, this is a dog man. Again, notice the uh, canine head, the hawk bent legs, but also notice the human-like shoulders and the human-like hands, even though they're elongated fingers with massive claws. This is where I got this photo. I saw this video of a family. It was a, obviously like a European family that was in the U.S., and they were driving through a national park on like a holiday. And the dad's driving, the mom's filming outside the front of the vehicle when kids are talking in the background. And they're just having a normal conversation of their family, right? And as they're driving down the road, all of a sudden you see this, just like that. That's it. This is all you see. They know. They're like, what's that? They know something just ran in front of the car in broad daylight in the middle of the day. Just like, just like that. But it was so fast, they couldn't make out what it was. I still frame the video, and that's what I got. Still frame the video, and that's the image I got. And like I said, it was so fast, you, the eye could not even perceive it. You could only tell that something ran by, but you couldn't even tell what it was. Could not tell what it was. And that's what it was. It was a dog man. Now, I've listened to thousands of eyewitness encounters. I've interviewed eyewitnesses. I've got a background uh, in, in, in law enforcement and military. Um, I've, I've spoken to military personnel that have seen these creatures face to face. The last episode I aired last week was a rebroadcast of an old show I did years ago with Hunter and TJ who are both former military colonels, both former special forces, and both former military intelligence. And they had direct knowledge of these creatures. TJ has seen a dog man five times, five times in person. Um, TJ saw, I mean, Hunter, the other one saw uh, reports on a, uh, that was supposed, he said he got by accident. They were supposed to go to the colonel, the base commander. And he saw it by accident, but, it was a story about uh, one of these creatures that was killed on a military base and had photographs of it. And he witnessed all that. Plus, Hunter knows other people that's had encounters with uh, these creatures. Um, so, but unfortunately, both of those guys are working back uh, intelligence jobs now. So they won't go public like they did when they were when they were newly retired. Um, so, and you find a lot of people that are involved in this, especially military side, they, if they're working a, a job, they're, they're going to protect their security clearance so they can pay their bills. You know what I mean? It's nothing out of the ordinary or, uh, that, you know, something that's not, you know, common or something we wouldn't all do for our family kind of thing. But anyway, you get the basic idea. So our government, again, um, you got the Fallen Angels, Book of Enoch, Book of the Giants, Book of Og, King of Bashan, Jasher, Jubilees. They all go together and they all tell of the story. Uh, the Bible uses all of them, uses them as, as source material, especially the Book of Enoch, uh, New Testament and Old Testament. And something else that's interesting about that when the Bible, when the authors quote it in the Bible, they don't say it as though this is, you know, new information they've got to explain to anybody. They explain this as information that the general public already understands. 
So that's very important to understand. Uh, the, sort, the, the authors of the Bible took this as credible sources, and it was something already taught and known among all the people. They didn't have to go into big explanations of this. This is stuff that's lost to our modern times, but you don't know your future unless you know your past. And that's where this is so critical and important, especially when Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be again at the end. So what's happened is, like I said, we've come full circle. So from the days of Noah, the evil in the days of Noah, we've come full circle. And just as he had these things in the pre-flood days, God wiped them out with the flood. Then after the flood, you had uh, Hitler in his time, all right? Pre-flood, that's my megalodon tooth <laughs> and my raptor claw. <laughs> you can see that, you know. Um, but you had the pre-flood days, and then you had the Nazis. You had the Nazis that took over and started doing their thing and trying to do a super soldier program. Here's my uh, imitation uh, clay tablet. Uh, um, of the the story of Gilgamesh. And what's neat is this is the tablet that's the recreation of the one where it actually gives a secular account of Noah's flood, all right? A secular account of Noah's flood on here, on this tablet. And this is what they found, uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of these little tablets that form the, the epic story of Gilgamesh. And that's going to play out later uh, in other shows I do because it's very important. Um, that's why I've got it. But anyway, so the Nazis and Hitler tried to weaponize these creatures when they found out about them. When they were destroyed by Allied forces, the U.S. and the Nuremberg trials and Project Paperclip hired many of those Nazi scientists to come to the U.S. and continue the same experiments and the super soldier program. The U.S. started a super soldier program, which you now have seen evidence of, not just of creatures in the field that we uh, showed earlier but also of the news reports I just showed you and uh, them talking about the Syrian ambassador. And remember, too, uh, I put this up at the beginning of the show where you had Abraham Lincoln that gave a speech talking about giants that walked the earth in the United States because they, the, the, they found the skeletons of these giants. There's, if you look in the film footage of 1800s, 1900s, there's thousands of giant skeletons found in the United States. But because of Darwinism, they cover all that up. The Smithsonian comes in and they cover all that up and they make it all disappear because they do not want people finding out that this stuff is real because it says the Bible is real. All right. And that also means the monsters are real, like this werewolf in the museum in, in England. All right. So uh, it's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. This is not stuff you want to see in the wild but it's the return of the days of noah that's what it is and unfortunately like god destroyed the earth in the flood he's also going to destroy our time with fire that again is isaiah 13 remimicked again in malachi chapter 4 all right and um and and malachi chapter 4 says god's going to use fire to destroy the earth instead of water this time all right that's a picture of something looking at you in the darkness you don't want to see. <laughs> so if you ever encounter one of these creatures, uh, do not provoke. Do not make any gestures that could be taken as hostile in any kind of way. Try to do whatever you can to get out of there. Uh, I also always recommend praying to the Lord. There have been many eyewitness accounts that I've heard that when people have encountered these creatures, they heard a little quiet voice in their head that gave them instructions on what to do. You hear that voice, you follow it if you want to live. <laughs> I promise you, that's your guardian angel speaking to you. All right. Follow that. All right. So follow the advice of what it tells you. These things are real. They're, the Lord told me one time that evil builds on evil, that builds on more evil, that builds on more evil until it creates real monsters. And that's what we have today. The sad thing is we've returned back to the days of Noah. Um, and by the way, in those days of Noah, there was a giant, um, you know, manipulation of, of the human race. And uh, that's returning too. 
So be aware. Be aware. We're in the days of Noah. And it's it takes, God also talks about a spiritual veil during this time, a great deception on the public, you know? And, and the Bible says that those that, that the chosen the, that go to heaven are the, are the few. It's the book of Matthew. Um, so don't follow the crowds, you know, follow what your intuition says. Try to develop relationship with God and stay close to God. Because that is the solution to all of this. And look, ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens to us. It doesn't matter what happens to our family, our loved ones. What matters is, do we get into eternity with God? That's all that matters. That's all that matters. That's what matters. Because if we do anything less of that, then we failed as human beings, as a human race, we failed in our life and our life's mission and the test of this world. So in this time that we have left and look, things are getting ready to go cray cray. Things are getting ready to go. Look, nuclear war is right upon us. Not only that, um, creatures attacking us is right upon us. All kinds of horrors out of hell and the Bible and the apocalypse is upon us. We're, we're entering those stages and it's going to get bad fast. Again, the solution is draw close to God, love people, try to be charitable, you know, try to try to develop that relationship as best you can. That's the solution. I used to have a teacher one time that said, you know, she talked about Dead Poet Society, the movie, which is a great movie. And she said it wasn't enough to reveal truth to these kids. Remember, one of them killed himself. Right. Which is a horrible tragedy. She says it wasn't enough to reveal truth. You have to also give a solution. So the reason I'm here doing all this is because I'm saying there's one solution and that solution is Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ is the solution to all of our wants, our ills, our hopes, our dreams, everything, everything. It's the solution. So as we're entering these dark times and these dark days, find God. Work on your relationship with God. Clean clean your life up. Clean yourself up. Uh, and, and draw closer to the Lord. Because we have to clean ourselves up in order to be close to God. We can't be doing wrong things and be in relationship with God. It doesn't work that way. We can't. We got to have a single heart, not a divided heart. God won't accept anything less. So um, I don't care what religion you are. Pray it. Use it. Draw closer to God. You know, some religions are more conducive than others to God, you know, but draw close to God while there's still time left to do so, because our time is short. You know, in the Catholic Church, we've got the Feast of Divine Mercy from St. Uh, uh, Faustina Kowalski. Great saint. All right. And I love the Feast of Divine Mercy, but a lot of people get it wrong because they only focus on the fluffy bunny side of, oh, God's mercy for everybody, which is great. But they don't understand the second part of her message that God gave her to warn people, which is that mercy is brief and it's a last chance, a last hope, because once it's done, comes the time of justice. And that's not going to be fun for anybody, good and bad alike. And that's the time we're entering now. The Feast of Divine Mercy is brief and it is now coming to an end. And what is left is going to be the justice. And if you look at salvation history, God has always used his enemies to punish and purify his own people, all right, under slavery, all right? And that's that's where we're heading. We're heading to craziness. I mean, look, the mark of the beast is right upon us. And I mean, look at Neuralink. Look at all this crazy stuff going on. Even uh, Bill Hates has spoken about this. Bill Hates has said that, oh, there's going to be this, this uh, connection to your brain directly to AI, like in a mark or chip or something. And it, you're going to get direct communication to the AI through the 5G system. All right. Uh, and what's going to happen is he said, it's going to give you instructions on how to live. If you follow those instructions, he says, well, it'll put digital money in your new digital account, which by the way, that means all our coin is going digital. We're going to have an economic crash total economic crash. They're going to reboot the system with a digital ID. 
and you have to have the mark to be able to have access to that system. That's what's coming. That's what's coming. So that being the case, uh, Bill Hates said that it's going to give you uh, speak directly to your brain and give you instructions on how to get digital money in your account. If you follow those instructions, you get the digital money. But what he doesn't say is what happens if you don't follow those instructions. All right. It's slavery. It's slavery. That's what it is. It's slavery. Just like we heard tonight with them talking about the super soldier program. They want people that they can program in order, not ones who can disagree or think differently or say no or, or have a have a have a their own voice or contrary voice. You know, our country's quickly becoming communist. And under communism, they, they communism does not allow uh, dissension. It just it eliminates competition to everyone thinks one way. Look at what's going on in China right now with the social credit score. It's insane. It's insane. And and everyone tells on everybody. It's, it's just a miserable society. And it's a it's a slave system. Who wants to live that way? Who wants to live that way? We're supposed to be Americans here. We're supposed to have freedom, individuality. We're supposed to have free speech, even if people disagree with it, even if it offends people. Do you know what free speech is? It's the ability to offend people. Otherwise, you can't ever speak truth because then everyone's offended. No one cares that I'm offended, you know, but everyone else wants to be offended on, on their little issues. You know what I'm saying? I'm offended when free speech is, is, is attacked, you know, which we see more and more every day. Or that we see American values of freedom and liberty being sucked into communism, socialism, uh, fascism. And by the way, our country right now is 100 percent fascist. When you have big government working with big tech, when they're in bed with each other against you, that's the definition of fascism. And that's where we're at today. Now, are they using real creatures and having breeding facilities and putting these things in the wild that are attacking people? Yes, that is real. They are creating real monsters. Now, they say that they're doing it for military purposes. All right. And I don't doubt that to some degree. However. I also believe it's to facilitate Agenda 21, renamed aptly Agenda 2030. I hmm, wonder why that is. What, what year are we approaching? Under Agenda 21 that was created by the Club of Rome, it's a globalist procedure that's a part of this, the Great Reset. And by the way, the Great Reset, that's about creating a one world government. That's what it is. It's destroying existing systems to create a one world government. That's what it is uh, with a one world leader uh, like the Antichrist. That's what it is. That's where we're at. That's what we're facing. OK, so everything, if you look at if you look at the signs of the times, which God said we can do, if you do a careful reading, that's the time we're in right now. It's the time we're approaching. Right. So it's very important to understand these things. They are releasing these things into the wild. And like I said, I think it's to fulfill Agenda 21 slash Agenda 2030. In Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, they want all people removed from remote wilderness locations. And they want everyone to live in uh, uh, mega cities. All right. Forced mega cities like the 15 minute cities. You know what I'm saying? smart cities where you can be chip tracked and controlled by AI 24 seven. Nothing you do is private. You're a complete slave of the system at that point and you can't get out of it. All right. That's their goal. That's their agenda. And I think that's part of the reason they're releasing these creatures into the wild. Most times what I hear from people that have had wide witness encounters with them is like, forget this. We're moving back to the city, you know, Hey, mission accomplished. That's what they wanted. All right. But here's something to keep in mind. We talk about the, the faith of Abraham, and we know that he lost his faith to a degree when he had, when he had a child with, with his, his, uh, his, his uh, slave, slave servant, you know, um, not, not having full trust in God because he was reaching an elderly age kind of thing. And his wife, uh, uh, you know, had menopause and everything else. And God, you know, punished him for that. And then he showed, he proved his faith again in the second chance when it came to Isaac and the sacrifice. And we all know how that went. But something that's not talked about is after that, 
God tested Abraham's faith again. He said he wanted him to go into the land of Cana. All right. Well, and he followed what God said, and he went into the land of Cana. Well, what's interesting about that is that is the land where the Cana bows come from. The worshipers of Baal in the land of Cana, Cana Baal. That's where the giants were. So God literally said, I want you to go where all the man-eating giants are. And Abraham, in faith in God, said, okay, I will go there. And that's what he did. And God promised to, you know, give him a numerous uh, prodigy, as, as many as the stars in the heavens kind of thing. And for being faithful to that. So what I'm saying that for is, don't be afraid that there's monsters in the world. Be aware of it. Be cautious. But just know God is always going to take care of you if you have a relationship with him, if you're trying to do good and you have faith. And in these times, I can't think of anything more important to our lives. So on that note, I'm going to I'm going to call this show and uh, I want to thank everybody for taking a part and being here tonight. I certainly want to take uh, say hello to my buddy Ed Visner that jumped in here, good friend of mine from the past, and John uh, that sent from here from the past. I see Jenny's in here as well. Uh, sorry, I can't read the comments a lot when I'm when I do a show without a guest, where I'm, I'm where I am the guest. <laughs> but anyway, look, God bless all of y'all. Pray. Thanks for coming. See y'all next time. Uh, please try to try and spread the show so we can get more subscribers and get the numbers up. And uh, you look for it because a lot of people are complaining they're not getting notifications and that kind of stuff. So anyway, God bless all y'all. Uh, please keep me in your prayers and, and what I'm trying to accomplish right now. And uh, and I, uh, I really appreciate everybody coming. And uh, it means a lot to me. And I've gotten so much outreach from different people for doing the show. And, and I just I really appreciate that. It makes it all worthwhile. It takes a lot of work to put these things together. It takes a lot of time. Uh, sorry if I'm running late at times. But anyway, um, love all y'all. Thanks for coming. See y'all next time. Keep the lights on.